church. We're glad you're here. A couple of things before we sing, before we hear the scriptures. Today we're contemplating a question that Jesus asks of Peter. I think it's a question Jesus asks of us. But I think the reason Jesus asks the question of Peter is because Jesus knows this is a question we ask of ourselves. So we're going to get around to that in a little bit. Um, but first, I'm going to uh, ask ushers if they would bring uh, these red books forward. And uh, we invite folks to let us know that you're here. It's not mandatory, but we invite you to do that. So that's, that's in process. I see it's happening. Also, um, we have prayer cards later on in the worship service. We'll pray together and we invite you, if there's something or someone that you'd like us to pray for, jot it down and um, Pastor Rachel will pick those up uh, as we're singing our opening hymn. A couple of things, actually I guess just one change to the order of worship and it's an addition. The gospel lesson this morning, um, we'll read Matthew 16 verses 13 through 23. So just a couple of verses longer than what's listed in the bulletin. And um, I don't see any little ones here, but if any come in, they're welcome to um, come down to the front or, or to the back, depending on where they're most comfortable to spend time as we worship together. So we're going to sing. This is a hymn that's been around for a while in United Methodist churches. We're going to sing verses 1 through 4. It's number 57 in the red hymnal, Over a Thousand Tongues to Sing. I chose this because um, Charles Wesley really captures this notion that there's, there's not enough breath, there's not enough life, there's not enough time, there's not enough energy to sing all the praises that, uh, that are due to the God who made us, the God who loves us unconditionally, the God who promises to be with us. So let's hear an introduction, then I'll invite you to stand. We'll sing verses 1 through 4, hymn number 57, O for a Thousand Tongues to Sing. Good morning. Please join me in <clears throat> reading responsively Psalm 124. It can be found on page 846 of the red hymnal and also on the screens. If it had not been the Lord who was on our side, let Israel now say, if it had not been the Lord who was on our side, when foes rose up against us, then would when their anger was kindled against us. Then the flood would have swept us away. The torrent would have gone over us. Then the raging waters would have gone over us. Blessed be the Lord, who has not given us as prey to their teeth, but escaped as a bird from the snare of the fowlers. The snare is broken, and we have escaped the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth.
So I brought with me something really special. You know, um, I've known little children when they take their first dance class, put a, put a tutu on them, and they think they're what? A ballerina. Yeah, you gotta have the outfit, right? I remember when I used to play the piano for the Hartford Ballet Company in Connecticut, when, um, when a young woman graduated from ballet slippers to point. I can remember seeing these young women with those shoes walking around. This was their, they'd made it, all, sort of. The uh, pain was just about to begin, but this was the goal, right? I remember um, thinking as a little boy, seeing people in uniforms like police officers, firefighters. Where I went to school, there were Catholic nuns who taught they had habits. This, what they wore set them apart. See this hat? How many of you know what this is? A tilly. It's a tilly. It's a hat, but it's a special hat. It's a tilly. Now, before this hat was mine, this was my dad's. And he used to wear this hat when he'd work around the house. The tilly hat. It floats. Wait a minute. This is the finest in all the world. This is insured against loss. I don't know how they insure that you're not going to lose it, to be honest with you, but it's insured against loss. It's guaranteed for life, and it's replaced for free if it ever wears out. It floats, it ties on in the front and the back, it repels rain, it blocks UV rays, it does not shrink. Wow. I mean, it's the, this is the Tilly Endurable. And guess where it's made? <laughs> no, it's made in Canada. It's made in Canada. And you can go there, www.tilly.com. When, when I put this hat on, my dad gave me this hat before he died. And some of his sweat is still in there. You ready? Let me just say, you don't wear this for looks. I just, uh, just to be upfront about that, okay? But here it goes. My dad's Tilly. <laughs> so when I work out in the yard, mowing the lawn or whatever, I wear this. And when I put this hat on, you know who I am? <laughs> My dad. Well... I was going to say, I'm my dad's son. <laughs> I'm my dad's son. Yeah. Of course, I'm my dad's son even when I don't have this on. But this, this hat has a way of reminding me who I am. Now, I'm my dad's only son. I have two sons. I'm not sure what we're going to do when, when, we, when we get to that. I might have to buy a Tilly. And, uh, oh. Oh, yes. That's why I come to church, because you people are smart. That, yes, I could give it to my daughter. Why not? Absolutely. Who are you? Who, who are you? Nora, who are you? Nora. If I were to call you... Isabel, how would you feel about that? That's not your name. You're Nora. If I were to say, who is Nora, then what would you say? That's, <laughs> That's me. <laughs> how hard is this, you know? Adults make this very complicated. Yes. 
I hope that you will always know you are Nora. What, what will happen if you meet another person named Nora? Oh, you spell your name N-O-R-A-H. Most people spell Nora N-O-R-A, N-O-R-A. Okay, I don't think I'm gonna get past this with you. What if you meet, this will be my last question, okay? What if you meet another person who spells their name Nora, N-O-R-A-H, then what? You have the same name. Does it mean you're the same person? No, you're still you, and that Nora will be that Nora, but you have the same name. You know what, Nora? You might, sound, you, you might think this is kind of ridiculous, but I'm going to tell you something. I'm going to pray that you always know who you are. Yeah, okay. God, thank you for the things that remind us who we are and for the dreams we have that suggest who we might become. We're grateful for the name you give us and that you know us by name. And perhaps the most important thing that we can know about ourselves is that you love us. For this we're grateful. We give thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. So I'm going to sing a song for you now from a musical called Les Miserables. It is the story of a man named Jean Valjean who goes to prison, gets out of prison, and is unable to work or do anything really because of who he is. So he goes into, uh, he's taken in by some uh, priests, monks, like another priest I guess, and um, and he steals their silverware and runs off in the middle of the night and gets arrested again. And when they catch him and they bring him back, the priests say to the authorities, no, we gave those to him. And he has a religious experience and realizes that he's a child of God and goes on to make the world a better place. But he can't do that with his name because he's marked as a convict. So he changes his name and he moves to this town and, and takes over this factory where he improves the conditions for the workers and makes everything generally a better place. Everybody comes to rely on him, they become prosperous, uh, until he is discovered by the police inspector who's been chasing him, or wasn't really chasing him, but he, he recognizes him. That's the guy, he's a prisoner, that's not who that is. So he reports him to the authorities, and it's all gonna go terribly wrong when suddenly the police inspector Javert, who only knows him by his prison number, 24601, is that what it is? Um, well, he apologizes and said, I'm sorry I've made a mistake, you're not who I thought you were. Um, we've caught the real Jean Valjean and you're free to go. This man will go into slavery and go to the prisons and spend the rest of his life uh, paying for his crimes and, and you're free to go. And now we have a problem. Some people might think we don't have a problem, everything, the problem has been solved, but, but for Jean Valjean, there is a problem. He thinks that man is me, he knew him at a glance. The stranger he has found, this man could be my chance. Why should I save his hide? Why should I right this wrong? When I have come so far, and struggled for so long. 
If I speak, I am condemned. If I stay silent, I am damned. I am the master of hundreds of workers. They all look to me. Can I abandon them? How will they live if I am not free? If I speak, I am condemned. If I stay silent, I am damned. am I? Can I condemn this man to slavery? Pretend I do not feel his agony. This innocent who wears my face, who goes to judgment in my place, who am I? Can I conceal myself forevermore? Pretend I'm not the man I was before. And must my name until I die be no more than an alibi? Must I lie? How can I ever face my fellow men? How can I ever face myself again? My soul belongs to God, I know. I made that bargain long ago. He gave me hope when hope was gone. He gave me strength to journey on. Who am I? Who am I? I'm Jean Valjean. And so Javert, you see it's true. This man bears no more guilt than you. Who am I? Two, four, six, oh, one. A reading from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 16, verses 13 through 23. Uh, you can find this on page 18 of the New Testament of the Pew Bibles, um, but I will be reading from the New, An the New International Version. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked, who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but, my but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he ordered his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders and chief priests and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he said, this shall never happen to you. 
Jesus turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. and You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. The Gospel of the Lord. Sometimes a performance can help us to home in on ourselves as we're imagining the story that Adam laid out for us. So far this year, on my bicycle, I have not been passed. I'm... My goal for the season is 1,500 miles. I'm not there yet, but so far I haven't been passed. Yesterday, I went out for a quick ride, a 16-mile ride, and just as I was beginning the ride, I was about two miles into it, turning down Spear Street. Somebody cut in front of me, a noble adversary. Looked to be younger than me, and I could tell by his outfit that he was serious. And I could tell by his physique that he was strong. He was about 30 or 40 yards ahead of me going down Spear Street, south, going south on Spear Street. And I thought, I'm really glad that he's ahead of me because I think he would have passed me. And there would be my record. I would not be able to say anymore, I am the fastest (laughs) in Burlington. But he did not gain... In fact, when we came under the the interstate, the overpasses, and headed up the hill, I was surprised at how he slowed down. Now I have a dilemma. Is he just relaxing going up the hill? Because if I pass him and then he passes me again, that's the worst. That's the most demeaning. You really have to get off your bike and grovel if that happens. So I slowed down and stayed behind him as we went up the hill. And now once we cross the intersection between Spear and Swift, it's not entirely flat, but it's pretty flat and pretty straight. And I said, I bet he's going to take off. But to my shock, he didn't. And so I had this dilemma, am I going to pass him or not? And if I pass him, it's going to be eight miles of hell because I'm not going to know where he is in back of me. Is he drafting? Have I buried him? Have I overestimated his ability? So I say the worst that can happen is I have to grovel. I passed him, and I put out for eight miles, and I came to the place where I was going to turn around And he was about 15 to 20 seconds behind me. He'd been on me the whole time. And he was turning, he was taking a different route. So insofar as I'm able to discern, I'm still the fastest. (laughs) At least on Spear Street. Jen and I were having supper Friday evening. We were talking about an acquaintance of ours who's struggling with a teenager of theirs having some issues, and, and I said to Jan, didn't, you must have had a partner in crime when you were a, a younger person, somebody that you did stuff with that you never told your parents about. And Jan, so innocent, she sat there and she says, no, not really. A few seconds went by and she said, well, there was that time that we set fire to so-and-so's backyard and (laughs) the fire department came and I ran away. I said, well, did you tell your mother? Oh, no, (laughs) no, never, never told my parents, my mom, never told my mom about that. A few seconds went by, then she says, 
And, and then there was this other time I stole from my mother, I stole some money to buy cotton candy. I said, did you ever tell your mother that you stole this money? No, she said, but it was only a nickel. It wasn't that much. So a few seconds went by, and then Jan looked at me with this sort of innocent look on her face, and she said, you know, I was kind of a stealer and a liar. <laughs> Who do people say you are? Are you a stealer and a liar? Who do you say you are? It's a pretty straightforward question Jesus asks in the gospel this morning. Who do people say I am? And then more directly, who do you say I am? I don't think this is, at the heart of it, a theological question. I think this is a question that we ask ourselves all the time in a lot of different ways at a lot of different moments in our lives. We do this individually and we do this collectively. This happens where we work, this happens in our families, and this happens in our churches. Who do people say I am or we are? And so who, who would you say I am if I were to ask you and do a poll here? I think the heart of a midlife crisis is probably someone who has suddenly lost track of who they are and they're struggling now. I think we assume not incorrectly that Jesus had a measure of confidence in terms of his own identity. I don't think Jesus was struggling to find out from someone else who he really was or who he actually was. I think this is not a theological test. I don't think he's putting the crowds or the disciples or Peter on the spot theologically like some kind of litmus test. I don't think that's what's going on. I think Jesus is going after something deeper. The anthem that Adam sang from Les Mis about this man, Jean Valjean, one synopsis of the storyline goes like this. The literal meaning of Les Miserables is the miserable ones. The characters are French and the book is centered around their lives the time period is the early 1800s. The main character, known as Jean Valjean, is an ex-convict who is struggling with sorting out his life. I read that and I thought, my gosh, that's the Bible. The Bible is the story of human beings discovering they're sinners, and trying to sort out their lives in relation to each other, to their culture, to the cultures and the people around them, and ultimately in the relationship that they have with God as they know God to be. They're struggling to sort it out. That's what the Bible is about. Remember Tevye and Fiddler on the Roof when he is contemplating what would it be like to be a rich man? Would it spoil some vast eternal plan, Tevye asks God, if I were a wealthy man? A book that came out, I think, in 2013 by Charles Murray. It's called Coming Apart. And in this book, Murray bombards us with all these statistics. Um, Comparing 1963, so he takes a 50-year period, 1963 to 2013. And I just want to talk about one of the things that he lifts out in this book. Because I've heard people talk about this. It has to do with wealth and poverty. Before I tell you the statistic, are you a rich person? Are you wealthy? Are you middle class? Lower middle class? Upper middle class? Murray reports in 1963, 20% of Americans lived below, at or below the poverty line the, the, uh, as determined by the federal government. 20%. Today, by comparison, according to the U.S. Census Bureau, the poverty rate, the number of people living at or below the poverty level is 13%. Fewer people today than there were 50 or 55 years ago. 
But a Gallup poll at that time indicates that 95% of Americans categorized themselves, identified themselves as either middle class or working class. Now, this means that there were a lot of people who either were poor and didn't know it, or they were poor but didn't think of themselves, didn't want to be categorized that way. And what's interesting about this statistic is it works on the other end of the spectrum. That a large percentage of people we would call wealthy did not categorize themselves that way. They did not identify as upper class. And so Murray writes that maybe there's something in the, the founding DNA of our nation where we really struggled with this notion of class. Now, there are some glaring inconsistencies here. But let's just take this for a moment. Americans apparently believed in sizable numbers, those who were poor, that they just weren't going to think of themselves that way. My mother grew up in the Depression, was born in 1921, I believe, and I can remember her telling us stories. She had one pair of shoes and, uh, you know, th these people were poor as poor could be. Her dad had a, uh, an artificial limb, his, had an accident, his leg was cut off up to, the, up to the hip. One of the things that the people in the community said that now this, this family is going to go on the dole. This was a poor family. My mother says, I never knew I was poor till I was all grown up. I never knew we were poor. Her clothes were patched and patched and patched again. They didn't buy stuff at the store. My grandmother made all of their stuff. She never knew she was poor. My mother grew up in one of these families that did not identify as poor. Well, things are different today. Times have changed. We are parsed and carved up into so many categories. There's race and ethnicity. There's religion. There's gender, not just male and female anymore. There's social and economic status. Are you housed? Are you homeless? Are you transient? Are you food insecure? How much education have you had? And it's not enough to know that you've been to college. Do you have an advanced degree? And if so, how many? We have background checks and credit checks and emotional quotients, EQs, along with our IQs and the MMPIs. Everything is assessed from our DNA to our social safety net on a scale of one to 10, where is your depression, your anxiety, your anger, your cynicism, your self-esteem? You can take a two minute online test to find out what philosophical school of thought you uh, most closely identify with. I did this. I'm a rationalist, I identify with Plato according to this two minute test. I took an online color test to see what this had to say about me based on how, how I see color. And this is what it says. You, me, tend to always look on the bright side of life no matter what obstacle is in your way. You are a constant ray of light to all in your life. Isn't that good to know? I am your ray of sunshine. Yes, I am. Would that it were so. Who are you? And who, who do other people say you are? Who do you think you are? And how can you know for sure? So St. Paul says, 
Though I am free with respect to all, I make myself a slave to all so that I might win more of them. To the Jews I became as a Jew, to those under the law I became as one under the law, though I myself am not under the law. To those outside the law I became as one outside the law. To the weak I became weak so that I might win the weak. I've become all things to all people. And some people would say to him, you need therapy. There's something wrong with you. But as chameleon-like as Paul might have been, he's crystal clear on what he's trying to accomplish with all of these identities. He's looking to bring people to Christ. I do all for the sake of the gospel, he says. One time in first grade, I got into trouble in school. We had a substitute teacher. The next day, the regular teacher, Sister Alice, came back, found out that I'd gotten in trouble, and she said, I'm surprised. And she made it clear in front of the whole class. I didn't measure up in that one day, to her expectations of me. Now, we can argue whether she did this in a way that, you know, was somehow psychologically damaging, but still there's this notion of expectation. Who do people expect you to be, and how often do you live that life instead of who you really are? Hmm? I believe the most important thing to find in life is something or someone to which we can hold ourselves up against and receive an honest assessment of who we are. Sure, parents can do this to some extent, friends who are honest with you, teachers, life partners. But in truth, the best mirror to reflect who we are is the one that shines with two seemingly contradictory qualities. One is unconditional love, a mirror that tells us just how loved we are, and the other quality is uncompromising honesty. This is who you are. (laughs) This is who you are. That's what Peter is experiencing as he stands in front of Jesus. Jesus is the mirror that's reflecting back to Peter these two things. Peter's ability to interpret by way of divine revelation the truth about things. What a moment of clarity, of light, and of life. And several verses later, it is revealed to him. He has this this way about him that resists revelation, that resists the truth, that does not want to know who he really is. This isn't about who Jesus is. This is about who Peter is. And that's why I offer Christ to you. I offer you Jesus. Because better than any pastor or spouse, any teacher or mentor, any parent or priest, Christ can give you this reflection of who you are that that communicates with no shadow of a doubt that you are loved, that you're a child of God, and that you're a sinner. You might not be that ray of light and sunshine always that you think you are. (laughs) I offer you Christ. This story offers us Jesus, not as a litmus test for you to determine who He is, but so that you can stand in a place of certainty with regard to who you are. My goodness, it's not Jan's responsibility to do this for me or my children or my parents or my church. It's not your responsibility. This is Christ's. This is is the burden. This is the messianic work that Jesus takes on. Yes, he dies on the cross, you know, for our sins, but the messianic work isn't isn't is so much more than that. It's, It's him bearing the wonder, the mystery, the hope, and the burden of who you are. And so I offer you Jesus today, not as a theological litmus test. But as a place of freedom and liberation so that you can come to terms and come to grips with who you've been, with who you are, and with who you can become. This is the good news. 
This is really the only question that matters. This is, this is why Jesus asks it, and he, he uh, packages it in such a way as to just open all kinds of doors for us. Who do you say Jesus is? Who do you think Jesus says you are? Let's pray together. God, the good news is not always easy news. But it's always honest news. And that makes it so deeply, eternally good. The good news is light and life. It's a word of love and encouragement. Blessed are you, Simon Peter. Blessed are you, First UMC Burlington, blessed are you, for truth has been revealed in you, to you, and is being revealed through you. Help us to take this story home and to let it wash over us and set us free to enjoy life's blessings, to be liberated from sin and evil, to be liberated from despair and hopelessness. Let this word wash over us to let us know that if you're depressed, you're still loved. If you've messed up, you're still loved. Thank you for this question. And as we ponder it, help us to see all of the love and the power and the hope, all of the potential that lies in these several simple words. And in it and through it all, may we know Jesus and may we know ourselves. This we pray, O oh God, in, in Jesus' name. Amen. With our prayers this morning, we will lift up these joys and concerns that have been shared with us. But before we do, let us take a moment of silence and name ourselves before God. Lord God, here I am. These things, the good and the bad, the benign, and those things that harm others. For a moment, let us name ourselves honestly before God, who knows who we are. And the good news is that we are loved just as we are. And we lift up these things that are heavy on our hearts. We pray for Paul and Ricky as they go through a health crisis. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for all of the children, teenagers, and college students who are going back to school this week. We pray for a good school year for everyone. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for young people who are moving away from home for the first time this week. That as they discover who they are away from their families, they would always know that they are loved. Lord, in your mercy. We hold up in prayer our feasibility research team as they continue to find ways to make this congregation one that will last years and years into the future. Lord, in your mercy. We lift up the concerns of those gathered here 
and we lift up some names of those who we hold in our hearts this day. For Bill. For Dylan. Lord, in your mercy. And we lift up our own lives, our own adventures to discovering who we are. Hold us in your loving arms, O Lord. Lord, in your mercy. And we pray all these things using the words Jesus taught us so long ago. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Now is the time in the service where we invite our ushers to come forward and collect our offering. We invite you to give. Give so that we can continue to feed those who are hungry and clothe the naked and welcome in the stranger. Let us bring our gifts to God. And as we do, we will sing Light of the World. The words will be on the screen and are also in the little black hymnal on page 2204. Let us sing and bring our gifts to God. The greatest gift, O oh God, is the gift of yourself. And that's the greatest gift any of us can give. Why should we, why should we think that the divine could not do this? Thank you for all that brings us to this place. We don't deny the struggles. And we don't turn away from the injustices. We know there's much work to do. Thank you that we can be in community to do this work together, to encourage one another, to take a step closer to Jesus, and together to be in this world such that 
sin is forgiven, injustices are corrected, and your love, your reign can abound. Bless the offering that we bring forward today. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. I have a couple announcements, and I know Rachel has a couple. Um, next Sunday at 2.30 at the Baptist Church, First Baptist Church over on St. Paul, I think is where it is, at, um, there's going to be a prayer vigil, an ecu- uh, interfaith prayer vigil. This is at 2.30 on Sunday afternoon next week, and this is a, a prayer for healing and for unity in the community. So that's at 2.30 next Sunday, September 3rd. Next Sunday also, Adam, if we could put that slide up. Um, we're beginning a series in the church that will take us a couple of months called Celebration of Discipline. We're, we're using Richard Foster's book. This is a, not a new book, but um, the information in it, I think, is timeless. And so we've created a Facebook page, and we will link to it this afternoon, later on this afternoon, so you don't have to memorize this. However, it's pretty simple. If you go to Facebook and go First UMC Burlington Spiritual Disciplines, it's long, but it's memorable, right? First UMC Burlington, Spiritual Disciplines. That will bring you to the Facebook page. We're going to be posting on this page for the next couple of months and encouraging our church family to, to go there, uh, respond to the posts. There will be some, some videos, some links, etc. So next week, we begin this series with the spiritual discipline of meditation. What, what, is, what do we mean by meditation? Um, and so we've already put some things on this page, so I hope that you will avail yourself of it, okay? And um, I think... Those are my two announcements. Great. I do have a few announcements. One, I know that um, as college students come in, I want to remember to invite folks to engage in the congregation. If if you're new here, you are so welcome, and we'd love to help you get involved. Uh, In the pews, there are these uh, little pamphlets that says, Walking in the Way of Jesus. If you want to get involved in our congregation, boy, we have ways to get involved. Uh, We have a Sunday night soup supper where we serve every feedback, where we serve every Sunday evening, um, and uh, you're welcome to join in that. We have, you know, Sunday school opportunities, kids to teach and, and, and youth to hang out with, lots of great ways of getting involved. So I just want to lift that up um, as, uh, you know, our college community is just coming back. Um, so speaking of youth ministry, boy, here it comes, man. Everybody's going back to school this week. College classes start, the kids go back to school. I'm even going back to school. I'm for my ordination, I have to take uh, United Methodist polity, history, and doctrine, uh, and, and I think my classes start this, either this Thursday or next Thursday. I've got to double check that, but uh, I'll be in a year-long education thing myself. So we're all going back to school this week, um, and as we do, youth group gets started again. Sunday school gets started again. Uh, Sunday school will start up on the 10th, the week after Labor Day weekend, um, and our, our little ones will be invited back downstairs for more godly play and Lego Sunday School. It'll be fabulous. Um, youth group starts up the Tuesday after Labor Day, so the 5th. That's just a week from this Tuesday. Ripple will get started again. Um, and the following Sunday, we're going to have a pool party over at Mary and Judy's just to welcome everybody back again. Hopefully it won't be you know, like 50 degrees already by, you know, the 10th of, of September, but who knows. It won't matter. Our Vermont kids will be in the water. It doesn't matter if it's 40 degrees, they'll be in there. Uh, so we've got some great stuff uh, getting started. Um, and my last announcement is right after worship today, um, if you're interested, please stay right here. Uh, the feasibility research team is going to update you. We're, we're going to kind of do a, a presentation of what we've been up to, what we've been working on, and, and show folks the, um, the uh, request for proposals that we've been working on. We have copies here for folks to look at. We ask that you not leave the church with these copies. Um, we want to keep everything here. And part of that is a fairness to the businesses uh, and the, the developers that, that will be um, bringing proposals in. We don't want to give anybody a head start. It's just not fair. So we keep all of those proposals here. You're welcome to to take a copy. We've got a few here. So stay with us after church today and hear a little bit about what we're up to. It's been really, really exciting. I think those are all the announcements that I have uh, at this time. So with that, let us end our worship with the closing hymn, Bring Forth the Kingdom. Words will be on the screen. They're also in your little black hymnals on 2190. Let us sing as we close in worship today.
all of us, no matter who we are and who we bring before this God who loves us, go out and bring about this kingdom of mercy, peace, and justice wherever we find ourselves. And may God, who loves us so much, guide our steps this day, this week, and always. In God's name we pray. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you. Let us pass the peace and greet one another this day.